Remember when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict dominated the news cycle for all of 11 days earlier this year? It seemed like all we were hearing about was Sheikh Jarrah and missiles hitting Gaza. And then that was it. We moved on, as usual. Well, the decades-old conflict in the Middle East is not only far from over, Israel's new administration is proving it may be even harder for the US to negotiate with than the previous Benjamin Netanyahu-led one. Back in August, Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with new Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett to discuss relations between the two administrations, two new administrations in the US and Israel. But if there ever was a honeymoon, it might be over. Last month, Blinken said the Biden administration is going ahead with plans to reopen the Jerusalem consulate, the U.S. consulate, that served as America's diplomatic mission for the Palestinians, an office Donald Trump shut down in 2018 in a move that the Israelis supported. This week, Prime Minister Bennett, who has already opposed a two-state solution on his watch, told U.S. lawmakers in Israel that reopening the consulate would also be unacceptable. It isn't the only Israeli flex in recent weeks. Last month, Israel's new deputy prime minister and incumbent minister of defense, Benny Gantz, signed an executive order declaring six Palestinian human rights groups, some of which are highly respected by the international community and which receive funding from European governments. He declared them terrorist organizations tied to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, or the PFLP. The move to instantly outlaw the groups without a trial or right of response has drawn international backlash. And if it wasn't bad enough for a democratic country to just come out and ban civil society groups, there are now two new developments to this story. Multiple media organizations have all recently seen a confidential Israeli dossier that the government sent to EU countries back in May to convince them to stop funding those six groups, though NBC is not one of those media organizations. These outlets, they found that there was little concrete evidence and the Israelis failed to convince European countries to stop funding the groups. The evidence they did cite was largely based on grueling interrogations with two Palestinian accountants, one of whom, I kid you not, according to the dossier, said the financial ties to the PFLP that he was referring to were based on receipts which were used for activities such as Dabka courses, a traditional Palestinian dance, in Ramallah, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. The second part of the sentence, from which it is understood, that the receipts referred to a dance class was omitted from that Israeli dossier. Shock, horror. But wait, the story gets worse. This week, security researchers from the nonprofit group Frontline Defenders disclosed that spyware from the notorious Israeli hacker for hire company, the NSO Group, was detected on the cell phones of six Palestinian human rights activists, four of whom, surprise, were, empl were employees of the recently banned groups. NSO has said it has no information on who is being monitored by governments using its software. Regardless, last week, the US government blacklisted the NSO group for its earlier alleged targeting of journalists, rights activists, and government officials in several countries around the world. And the NSO's biggest state supporter, the government of Israel, is now lobbying DC to take the company off the blacklist. Whether surprising or not, these stories bridged together what were two separate diplomatic issues for Israel, banning human rights groups, and its support for the controversial NSO group. So what does this tell us about the direction Israel's new prime minister is taking his country in? And will the US ever take a tougher stance, a consistently tougher stance, against its closest ally? Joining me now to discuss all this and more is Martin Indyk, a former US ambassador to Israel and assistant secretary of state for Near East Affairs. He also served as President Obama's special envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and he's out with a new book on Henry Kissinger, master of the game, Henry Kissinger and the art of Middle East diplomacy. Martin, welcome back to the show. Um, let's start with what's going on in the news. You said in the past that Naftali Bennett becoming prime minister of Israel will, quote, be a kind of collective sigh of relief in Washington, that, quote, the comfort level would be a lot higher for the Biden administration. But Martin, taking the two-state two solution off the table, labeling Palestinian rights groups, some of which are very respected internationally, as terrorist groups, how is that bringing any kind of relief? How is that better? Remember, even Netanyahu didn't dare ban these groups and smear them as terrorists. Well, good to be with you again, Maddie, and thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I think that... that uh, the Netanyahu relationship with the United States had become so toxic with democratic governments like the Obama administration.
that uh, that was the relief that uh, I was referring to. Uh, Netanyahu, let's remember, was the, the Israeli prime minister who took his campaign against the uh, Obama administration's efforts to negotiate a nuclear agreement uh, constraining Iran's nuclear activity uh, to the Congress behind the back of uh, uh, President Obama uh, and attempted to yes. undermine his whole policy. So it was a very confrontational time. Uh, with uh, Bennett and, and his counterpart, Yair Lapid, the foreign minister, uh, there is a, uh, a different approach, although we can come to talk about the things that you highlighted, but the approach is designed to kind of take down the confrontational uh, approach to the United States and try to work with us, particularly on the issue of Iran, even though there's a disagreement about uh, how to proceed. It's not being being done in the way that Netanyahu did it. So that's that's the relief part of it. But are there differences and disagreements? Uh, definitely. And the ones you highlight are, are important ones, and you didn't even get to settlements. No, didn't even get to settlements. That's how many things are going on. But here's a question for you, Martin. It, doesn't it go beyond disagreements? When our other allies in the region, forget our enemies, forget the Irans and Russias and Chinas, when our other allies in that region, when Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the UAE, when they go after human rights groups, we, the United States, make sure to denounce it, even if it's just, even if it's just a statement, but we criticize them, we call them out, we say it's wrong. Now Israel's doing it. Why aren't we denouncing them in the same way? Well, first of all, I think it's important that, that in the case of the NSO, the spyware company, uh, the Commerce Department uh, labeled them a, a, a danger to the American national interest and blacklisted them. That was a pretty severe move. And, and uh, you know, I don't think you could say that we're dealing with them with kid gloves. Okay, I, I will come back to the NSO. I, I do want to come back to the NSO group. Just deal with my question about human rights groups. When a Saudi Arabia yeah, or a Turkey so, goes after a human rights defender, we call them out. Six human rights groups in Palestinian territories blacklisted, called terrorists. Why not the same reaction to Israel's authoritarianism? Well, I think that the reason, and you're not going to be satisfied with this, uh, is that uh, the administration is still looking at the evidence that, that uh, the government of Israel is providing them. And there seems to be some smoke there. I don't know because I haven't seen it, so I can't make a judgment. But I think there's, there's uh, a, a delay here while they actually look at the evidence and make a decision about it. I mean, the journalists who have looked at the evidence, as I mentioned, suggest it's nonsense. Um, but let me ask a broader question related to that. You've been part of the foreign policy establishment in D.C. for decades, going back to the 90s. You know that supporters of Israel always suggest that Israel's being picked on, singled out is the phrase, and that it's anti-Semitic to always go after Israel. That's, that's how criticism of Israel is often described. But isn't the reverse the case, Martin, that Israel gets away with doing things to the Palestinians that we condemn and denounce elsewhere to the point where you have this phenomenon known as progressive except Palestine, PEP, people here in the United States who condemn human rights abuses everywhere except Israel and the occupied territories. It's pretty blatant, is it not? Well, I think there's a kind of double standard used on, on both sides. Israel is often um, charged with, with uh, uh, criticism, is criticised and, and and attacked uh, in ways that other countries uh, are not and held to a higher standard uh, on a whole range of, of human rights activities. In particular, you refer to the to the war in Gaza and the extreme criticism that came uh, against Israel, in, including from Democratic members of Congress, including from strong supporters of Israel on the Democratic side in Congress. So it's not all one way, but there is a, I think, a, a a basic reality uh, that I know you're not going to accept or, or uh, consider fair, but Israel is our ally, and we do treat it differently to the Palestinians, who are not our ally, but we have an obligation to support their rights, including their right to self-determination.
I, I'm, I'm not disputing that reality. I'm not that naive. But I, what I'm saying is it goes beyond the ally argument because I gave you examples of other allies that we are willing to criticize. So it's not just about being an ally. It's something, uh, there's a special exception there given. And let me give you another example. And this is not an ally, but just in terms of human rights. There have been multiple, multiple reports of the scale of surveillance that Palestinians in Israel and the occupied territories are facing. The Washington Post, I'm sure you saw, reported on the expansion of surveillance through facial recognition programs across Hebron, a mass data collection system that former Israeli soldiers have called the Army's secret Facebook for Palestinians. Then you have the reports that high-ranking Palestinian diplomats, Palestinian activists have been hacked by spyware from the Israeli-owned NSO group. And I just look at that and I wonder, hmm, Orwellian mass surveillance of minorities in Xinjiang, China, gets rightly condemned here in Washington, D.C. But surveillance of Palestinians in the West Bank, ah, oh, it's not a story, really. Outside, well, it's good for the Washington Post, but doesn't make it into kind of congressional denouncements. Well, in the case of the NSO, as we said, you know, they, the Commerce Department has put them on, on their blacklist and has done so because of uh, the way in which this spyware is being used for to violate human rights. Um, and I don't know whether that includes the Palestinians, but let's take the Washington Post uh, uh, report on its face value and, and um, you know, therefore it would apply. The, the, you know, the Commerce Department has taken a strong position. It didn't do that without the White House and the State Department uh, endorsing it. So okay. I do think there is a concern for Palestinian human rights. It may not be uh, exactly the way we treat other countries, as I say, because, yeah, there is an exception made to Israel so, because it's Israel is regarded as our ally. So speaking of how to deal with our ally, Israel, I want to talk about your new book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. You go through years of Kissinger's diplomacy in that region in hopes that the U.S. can learn lessons from it. In all the documents and interviews and archives you comb through, including, I believe, 12 interviews with the man himself, what do we learn about Kissinger and that period that's new? I mean, this is a man who's published a 3,000-page memoir on himself. What's unique in your book, Martin? So I think what's unique about it is that there, there's been no uh, serious, deep history of Kissinger's work to try to achieve uh, peace in the Middle East, or at least lay the foundations for an American-led peace process. Um, and a lot of the controversy about Kissinger is focused on uh, his activities in other areas of the world, mostly when he was national security advisor, whether Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Chile, and so on, and Bangladesh. But, but here, Kissinger was trying to make peace, or actually trying to establish order using the peace process as his, as his mechanism. And, and he was quite successful at that. And having uh, tried and, and failed several times myself, part of the Clinton administration, the Obama administration, I thought we could learn something from that. That's why I went back and took a look at it. I tried to illuminate uh, the story, which is documented, a treasure trove of, of documents and Israeli archives, uh, with my own experiences to try to, to figure out how yes. to and how not to but Martin, uh, make peace. Martin, isn't Kissinger, though, an embodiment of everything that's wrong with U.S. policy towards Israel? I mean, he was openly biased, as even you acknowledge in your book. We know he said himself his policy was to, quote, isolate the Palestinians. He refused to basically acknowledge their existence, blocked the PLO from negotiations at the time. He embodied the double standard towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And yet you're saying, including in a recent piece in The Atlantic, perhaps Biden could learn something from him. Do you really want us to go backwards to the 70s in our approach to the Palestinians? No, and I, I don't think uh, Kissinger, Kissinger's approach to the Palestinians today is uh, the same as it was in the 1970s. Let's think back to the 1970s before you were born, I guess. Uh, but in those days, the, the PLO was an out-and-out -out terrorist organization. Oh, and Kissinger's watch, they murdered two American diplomats uh, in, in Sudan. Um, and they were dedicated to the overthrow of uh, King Hussein in Jordan, uh, another ally of the United States, and to the destruction of Israel. So it's not unreasonable that Kissinger took the position he did at the time. But uh, nowadays, he, he accepts the idea that the Palestinians should have a state. And he talks specifically about a, you know, the need for the Palestinians now to have attributes of sovereignty. Yeah. A state in the making, uh, and that's part of his 
gradualist incremental approach, which I think is very relevant today to a situation in which the Palestinians are so divided and the Israelis are so divided that neither side can find a pathway to get to a two-state solution. So we've got to find I a mean, more step-by-step you know, -step approach. And that's what I argue. I mean, the problem, of course, with gradualism and incrementalism is it's great in theory. It's great for you and I to sit in Washington, D.C. in America and say this stuff. But the Palestinians are living under the longest military occupation on Earth. Uh, so that's the problem with the whole gradualism and incrementalism thing. But before we get out, run out of time, I do want to ask a very important question. This is a book on Kissinger and the Middle East, which has a sympathetic tone at times. It's at times very admiring of him and his achievements, I think it's fair to say, in that region. But I wonder, was it a deliberate decision to focus on Kissinger and the Middle East and avoid his role in Pakistan, Bangladesh, East Timor, Chile, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, places where he was accused of war crimes, complicity in genocide? I mean, this is a man, Martin, who, according to Yale University historian Greg Grandin, has the blood of three to four million people on his hands. Yeah, as I said, he's a controversial uh, character, but my purpose was to study his role in the Middle East, which hasn't been studied, and that's my area of expertise. Um, and all the other issues that, that you uh, talked about have been dealt with in great detail. But his efforts at actually trying to make peace in the Middle East has not. And so that's the justification for looking at the book. On top of that, because he is master of the diplomatic game, I wanted to see what we could learn from that. I guess that's a valid argument, but I guess put yourself in the shoes of some of his victims. You could say, well, you know, it's very hard to write a book about him in isolation, to compartmentalise a man accused of so many crimes. Even if we accept he did a good job in the Middle East, a big question in itself, how do you divorce that from all the war crimes elsewhere? It's like saying, hey, let's write a book about how Mussolini made the trains run on time. Well, I'm not divorcing it from it. I'm just focusing on one area as the other books have focused on, on those areas, like the blood telegram. I looked at his role in, in Bangladesh. Um, so I'm not ignoring it. I stated up front in, uh, in the book itself. And the book itself, while admiring of his diplomatic prowess, uh, is nevertheless quite critical of uh, opportunities he missed to avoid the Yom Kippur 1973 war and opportunities that I think he missed and documented there to, to make peace, particularly to advance the cause of the Palestinians at that time in a Jordanian context, but it, which could have changed the whole trajectory of the Palestinian cause in a, in a more positive well, way than the way it turned out. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.